morning, everybody. What a wonderful day we have today. It's nice and cool. We turned up the heat so you wouldn't all freeze. <laughs> but it's a glorious day, and we're here to worship the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for being here. Today we will be led by the Reverend Dr. Leslie Veen, who is sitting in for our pastor, Doug Schoonover. We have a few announcements to be made. I want to take care of them right away, and then we'll start with our service. We'd like to hear from Mary Anderson. She has something to say to us. Thank you, Fred. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, if you open your uh, your bulletin, you'll you'll see something in there about Christmas. Come on, eight months ahead of time. Well, at any rate, um, the elders in a in AGC agreed to hold a Victorian holiday market, and that's going to be around December seventh. And we're talking about it now because um, I'm calling for all people who do crafty things. Yes, and I want to give everyone uh, time to think about what you want to make or talk to your neighbor or your daughter or your granddaughter or somebody that you know does, does some unique item. And I want to give it enough time so that you can uh, get all these things done. So down at the bottom it says call or email mary anderson you can give my information out to anyone that you think would is interested in making a craft uh, so that i know what kinds of things are going to be made and we'll talk about more of this as as uh, the year goes along but that's all i have to say for now about this thank you next we have an important update by Dale Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. As uh, everybody I'm sure has seen, the modules are now in place for the school. So we have a short video of them actually placing the modules because a lot of you couldn't be here to see it. So if you want to go ahead and roll that. So the modules, there are seven modules that arrived on trailers. Actually, they're not on trailers. The wheels are just bolted to the bottom of the modules. And then as they lift them up on the crane, they drop, un unbolt the, the wheels, and they just stay there, and they just lift the whole module across. There's seven modules total, five for the classrooms, and two for the multi-purpose room. Uh, I asked the representative from um, Mobile Modular, who makes the units, what job had the most modules that they've ever put together? And they did a hospital edition that had 84 modules. So they drop them into place, but they don't actually put them exactly where they're going to go. They leave space in between because they have to be able to get up into the, between the modules and connect all the HVAC, air conditioning, heating ducts. And then they have a small device that slides them into place and they lock them into place. So this was the first one, and then now they're getting ready to put it on the foundation. And we're not going to have you list, watch all the modules, because once you've seen one going through the air, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so after they get the modules in place and get them adjusted and locked and various points along the line, there are inspections that will happen. And then they, uh, as, then Thursday, they brought the rafters in, and those were also listed, uh, lifted up by another crane. And then they'll get them all positioned. I think they're all locked together now. And then they have to stucco them, put the roof on. Um, they also, uh, there is a small entryway that is going to be actually built on site. But it looks like they will be on track to have these schools starting for the fall. So this is uh, lifting the last module into place. And there you can see them. They haven't actually connected them together, but the next shot I think shows it's a little far away. But this is where they're putting the rafters on, and they've actually got them all connected. So, yep. Thank you, Dale. 
Now the Reverend Dr. Leslie Veen will take over on the pulpit. Thank you very much, it's great to be back with you. It's been a bit, but um, but I'm always happy to be able to be with you, and I was happy when Pastor Doug reached out to me, invited me to come. So thank you for welcoming me, and let us open ourselves with some prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for waking up and being able to be here in your community. Bless us with your spirit, join our hearts together as we worship you, and let us be filled with your love as we do so. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we gather, we gather together as a community, and one way that we do that is by passing the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Share with one another Christ's peace. Yes. <laughs> when we call. Come, let us put our trust to God. The Lord fills our hearts with gladness. Come, let us sing God's praises with shouts of joy. The Lord grants peace to our weary souls. Come, let us rest by quiet waters of God's grace. Amen. Let us sing together. Ciao. 
I just want to ask to make sure, do we have any children with us today of the younger story? I know we're all children at heart, right? Yeah. Well, welcome to all. It is great to be here. Let us listen for God's word together today as it is read to us for by Jews. Prayer of Illumination. Let us pray together. Redeeming God, as we hear your word spoken to us, open our eyes to see the risen Christ. Open our ears to hear the good news of his salvation for all the world. And open our minds to understand the mysteries of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder in your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that might be, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone. O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. The Gospel reading is from 1 John 3, verse 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What he, we will do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for he will, we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The Gospel reading is Luke 24, 36b to 48. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
God bless the reading. Please rise. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our minds and our hearts that we might be transformed by what we hear from you this day. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever gone to a reunion with folks that you haven't seen for a while and you walk into the room and you go, I must be in the wrong room. <laughs> These aren't the right people. I had that happen when I went back for my 10-year high school reunion many years ago, walked into the room, and I walked right back out thinking, this is not the right place. I don't know any of those people. Thankfully, someone had recognized me and came and got me and brought me and put, took me back in. That was the right room. They were the right people. My eyes just didn't recognize them because as we great age, as we get older, our bodies change, our bodies grow, and they, some of the things that make us us stay the same, but some change. And it takes our eyes some time to recognize those differences. I walked in with those images from my high school yearbook of who these people were. And that wasn't what I encountered. And so it took some time for my eyes and my mind to adjust, to see those core characteristics that were still there, but that had changed and morphed in some ways. What I had known before got in the way of me being able to see what was now. So I had to take some time to be with these people, to see who they were now, who they had become, and who they were becoming. It is a natural progression of life that we change as we grow and as we age. This is a natural process for all of nature. 
And we have to kind of know what's in our control to keep the same and what we have to just let go of. And sometimes those things that change aren't things that are welcomed <laughs> so much, right? We're like, oh, I wish that I was still whatever, right? But we grow, we change, it's how we've been made. We can keep some things the same by uh, diet or exercise or things like that, but mostly it's beyond our control. And we are invited to have peace about that because God is always doing something in us no matter what our exterior might look like. The changes, though, aren't just to our exterior, although those are the ones that are often the most noticeable when you walk into a room and you see people you haven't seen for a while. It's the exterior that really looks different on first blush. But as we are with people that we haven't been with for a while, we start to notice other things that are different as well. Emotionally, mentally, they have grown as well. We have grown as well. We have gained knowledge. We understand the world in new and different ways. We understand our own place within the world in new and different ways. And that makes us show up differently in spaces. We call this being mature, right? We grow and we mature because we grow in our ability to discern, discern right from wrong, good from bad, how we are to show up in the world, and how we are to react when we are to react. We call this maturity, this growing in knowledge, and how to be in relationship with our world and with our God. This comes through experience, through learning from our life lessons. This comes through trial and error, sometimes painful, sometimes fun, but always, if we are open to it, helping us to develop into more fully who we are to be as human beings. So not only do we grow in our physical uh, appearance, not only do we grow in our mental and our emotional beings, we also grow in our faith, if we are faithful to God and God's calling in our lives. We are encouraged to deepen our connection to God, to claim ever more firmly God's love for us, leaning into our reality of being children of God. That takes some learning to know what does that even mean to be a child of God, claimed as beloved by God. What does that even mean? We have to learn and grow and lean into knowing what that is. It helps to be open to seeing how God is moving and creating and doing new things, both in us and in those with whom we encounter each day. God reveals God's self through us. God reveals our, God's self through others. And God reveals God's self through this marvelous creation that God has made. Our growing in faith also helps us to grow in knowing how to respond to God's love for us. God loves us and hopes and desires that we will love God back. God doesn't love us because we love God, but God loves us because God loves us. And God's hope is that we will love back. And that, what, that is what our deepening faith will help us to learn, is that God loves us no matter what, but that our joyful response is to love God back. And by loving God back, we are loving God's creation. Our passage from 1 John encourages us to love God back by living law, lawless, not to <laughs> avoid living lawless lives. Okay, that was a mouthful. But to not sin, to live into God's being 
and to live into who God has made us to be by avoiding sinning, which in the uh, reading from 1 John is lawlessness. But that's a hard thing to do. How do we live lawless lives? So we looked to Jesus as our model. Jesus was also one who was being and becoming throughout all of the years that Jesus was on this earth. He, in our gospel reading from Luke today, had a high school reunion kind of moment. He walked into the room. During all of this Easter season, we are reading stories where Jesus is getting same kind of reactions. Each time he walks into a room, the people there don't recognize him. They don't understand who he is and why he's there and how he has come to be there. So he has to help them to recognize him. They were holding on to former images of Jesus. And by holding on to those images, they weren't able to see who he was now who he was becoming for them. They were living in the past, remembering how their relationship had been, how he had been with them, how they recognized him. Their fear from having lived through the trauma of having him killed by the, the empire was clouding their vision and making it difficult for them to recognize that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, I don't know that I can blame them all that much because people rising from the dead isn't something we're used to seeing, right? So it's now we have this, this thousands of years of witness to help us to understand that that was what was happening, but they were living it in the moment. Jesus had talked to them about this, but when it's something you've never experienced before, Words don't really make a difference. They don't really sink in. And so he had told them that he would come back, and they're like, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> but then he was there, and they were like so astonished because it didn't make sense to them. And the fear of having gone through that traumatic experience of watching him die and then having his body taken away, they didn't understand what they were seeing. And so he had to be with them, to let them see him, to remind him of who they were so that their past images could meld with the current reality and then they could say, oh, you are Jesus. You are the one that we have been with. You are the one who have opened up our eyes to God's love in this world. He showed them his hands and his feet. He ate with them. He helped them to understand that he was the person that they had been with, although he had also changed through resurrection. He was who he was even as he was becoming new to them. He reminded them of the words that he had told them, how he said that he would die and he would come back. He reminded him, them that this was a fulfillment of the scriptures. And as we heard, he opened up for them the scriptures to help them understand how him standing there was a fulfillment of so much that had been said throughout the scriptures. Have you ever had it that you hear words and they don't make sense until you're in the middle of a situation and you're like, oh, Oh, that's what they were talking about. Now I see how that works. Now I see why this is important. That's what Jesus was doing for them. He said, now that we are in this place, in this time, and you have seen what God has done in and through me, now let's listen to the scriptures again. Let's hear how God's message of love and conquering death and fear has been shared throughout all of scripture and how it has new meaning for us now that we are living in this reality where death has been conquered, where fear has no place, 
where Christ's peace given by God is real. Throughout all the times that Jesus is meeting with his disciples in these days after the Easter resurrection, each time he sees them, he begins by saying, peace be with you. Peace be with you, because he knows that they have fearful hearts. He knows that they are confused about what they are to be doing now. He knows that they feel like they have anything but peace in their lives. So each time that Jesus sees them, he begins by saying, peace be with you. So that their hearts and their minds and their eyes can be open to seeing Jesus in their midst and to knowing that God is doing wondrous things in and through him for them. So Jesus comes in this story and is with them and is opening their eyes to the scriptures and many are believing that Jesus is real and that this is their leader come back to help them understand God even deeper. And yet there are some who still doubt and don't believe. They had seen Jesus die, those images were too strong in their mind. There was no way for them to reconcile that image with the image of Jesus standing before them. And so they continued to doubt. They listened, but they didn't fully believe that he was Jesus, the Son of God, standing amongst them. Throughout Jesus's ministry, he demonstrated what it meant to grow and build and become who God would have us to become. We don't have many stories of his childhood. We have the stories of his birth, of where the wise men come and recognize him and honor him. We have a few stories of his precocious teen years where he kind of ditches his parents to go and be in the temple makes them scared and have to go running back to say, where is Jesus? Where he's got so much on his heart that he's already in the temple teaching. When people are like, who is this young whippersnapper, right? What's he doing here? How does he think that he has anything to share until they listen to him and they recognize that he actually knows a lot and is able to open up scriptures in ways that no other teacher ever has. So we have a few of those stories that help us to show who Jesus is as he's developing. But then we get this crash course of his three-year ministry where he just comes into full fullness of his own self and who God has called him to be, starting with his baptism, and leading all the way up to his death and resurrection. We see in all of these stories, Jesus being God's love present in the world, even as he is becoming more to the people who are around him. He is able to embody God's love perfectly. He welcomes the strangers. He eats with the outcast. He doesn't let the law come before love of others. He centers people, and as he centers people, he makes sure that God's love is poured out onto them in fullness. He faces his death because he knows that this kind of love and welcome is challenging for those who want to keep the law in in front of us and as the center instead of the people. And so he knows that he is threatening them in the way that he is living. But in his resurrection, he is bringing peace and hope that casts out fear. He is doing all of this as he leads a sinless life. Our scripture today from 1 John tells us that sin is lawlessness. It's separation from God. It is doing things that make us act in ways contrary to how God would have us act. 
It is in doubt. It is in disbelieving that we are led to these sort of actions. Jesus never went there. Jesus gives us the model of what it means to live fully as children of God, remi remaining united with God throughout it all. Even as he faced death, he said in his prayer, not thy, my will, but thine. He knew that if he were to follow his will, to not follow it, this all the way through to death, he would not be fully living into his purpose here on earth. Jesus embodied God's love in this world, and he never wavered from trusting God, believing that love, God's love, conquers fear and death. And so he gives us the example of what it means to live perfectly into God's love and to live a sinless life. Now we are encouraged to live a sinful, sinless life, but it's not going to be possible for us in this life to fully embody a sinless life the way that Jesus did. That is because God has made us human with human will. God has made us that way because God wants us to freely choose loving God, to freely choose to respond to God's love by loving God back. God doesn't want us to just be forced into this by the way that God has created us. God wants us to choose it. And so whenever there is this possibility of choosing, there is always the possibility of choosing a way that leads us away from God rather than leading us to God. Our walk of faith is one that helps us to do more of the choosing towards God and less of the choosing away from God. Our deepening in our faith, our growing in our faith, is always seeking to be more united with God and learning how to turn away from those things that pull us away from God. How do we learn to be like Jesus and say, not my will, but thine? Sometimes it's easier than others. Sometimes we can let go of that control that we need to feel and say, God, I give this to you. Other times it's really difficult. It's hard to let go of. That is our invitation from our scriptures today, to live into God's naming us beloved children who were invited to live back in full loving of God, uniting ourselves with God, trusting God, believing that God has the best in mind for us, learning how to live more fully into it as we mature in our faith, knowing that God is there for us, always seeking us, always uplifting us, and living God's love out to all with whom we come into contact. May that be so as we go about our lives this week and every week. Amen. Amen. Part of the way that we respond to God's love is by bringing our gifts and offerings to further God's work in this world. Let us gather our gifts and offerings this morning. <laughs> God. 
like prayers for my nephews, Barton and Myra, who's in the hospital with pneumonia and on a ventilator. I would like prayers for Richard Smith. He's in my parish. Uh, he's doing fine as far as his bone replacement. He had a little surgery done to remove some of that. Um, but now he's experiencing, I believe it's his left shoulder with pain. He's had, he has Parkinson's and he's just gone through so much for almost a year and now this has happened. So prayers for uh, good uh, testing uh, and uh, a recovery so that he can travel soon. Thank you very much. Yes, I just want to say prayers for Pastor as he's moved through this past week, and now we'll move through the next week of his time away from us. Pray for his well-being. I'd like prayers for my son, Eric. He had a disc removed from his back, which was causing him problem, and he's not healing very well at this time. They took another MRI, and hopefully he'll start to get better. I'd like to ask for prayers for tooth issues. There used to be a member to this congregation known as Marty Price. He suffers multiple illness issues uh, and uh, he is now confined to bed. 
so I'd like some prayers for him to for his diabetes, his neuropathy, and a few other things. Uh, I'd also like some prayers for Israel. They have been attacked again. And uh, we know scripturally that they've always been under some sort of attack. But this is really getting to be nasty. I mean, they're being attacked by several different nations, several different terrorist groups. And I'd just like to see some peace in Israel. So God asks us to pray for the peace of Israel. And I'm asking you to do it. Thank you. Pray as Jesus taught us, prayer that he taught his disciples, our heart. 